Well, welcome everybody. So glad you are joining us this evening. A little housekeeping before we begin. We have transitioned to a webinar format for our presentations, so you can hear us, but we can't hear you. So if you have a question for Michelle, just type it in the question box at the bottom of your screen, the little box that says question and answers, and I'll read those questions to Michelle at the end of her presentation this evening. We are also recording this tonight, so if you know friends who would like to see it who aren't able to join us, we will post the link in our next Extreme History Project newsletter, or you can email us for the link. So, welcome. My name is Crystal Alegria, and I am the director of the Extreme History Project. Extreme History is a local nonprofit that makes history relevant. We do this through walking tours, this lecture series, workshops, and most recently, a podcast, which is very exciting. If you haven't heard, we just launched a podcast called The Dirt on the Past. We interview historians, archeologists, and other heritage professionals about their research and why it matters today. We have partnered with our local community radio station, KGVM, to make this podcast happen. You can find the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts or on our website, extremehistoryproject.org, or on KGVM's website, which is kgvm.org. Or you can catch our interviews on Sundays around noon on KGVM at 95.5 on the radio dial, if you live here locally in Bozeman anyway. I would also like to thank our sponsor for this presentation this evening, Vicki York. Vicki is a longtime supporter and friend of the Extreme History Project. And we really, really appreciate her support tonight and always. Thank you, Vicki. I know you're out there in the virtual audience, so thanks for being there for us always. We're so excited to have Dr. Michelle Coriel with us here tonight. Michelle is a free, freelance art writer and author with a master's degree in art history and a PhD in American Studies, American Art. Congratulations, by the way, Michelle. She enjoys engaging her poetic style as a basis for conveying the essence of the creative process in the visual arts. Her work can be seen both regionally and nationally. Michelle has published four books and received a number of awards for her nonfiction as well as her poetry. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Michelle Coriel. Welcome, Michelle, and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Crystal, and thank you, Vicki, for uh, your sponsoring this lecture series, and thank you to the Extreme History Project for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, I'll just start right in. Um, art, either pop culture or high culture, can be both a lens and a mirror. It is a way we see others and, more importantly, a way we see ourselves. Before the Montana modernists, the way Montanans were able to see themselves through art was limited. But tonight, let's take a look at the artist who broke through the myth of the West, who brought a modernist style to Montana <clears throat> in order to reflect the identity of a post-war society. My goal is to recognize that art in Montana is not necessarily brought from old cowboy tropes. Instead, my intent is to elevate artists who offer Montanans an option, a new way to view themselves as reflected through art. Montanans no longer had to see themselves bushwhacking through the wilderness or corralling wild Bronx, although that option was not being taken away. With a modernist lens, Montanans could find an identity that meshed with their lived life, not necessarily an imagined or unattainable one. Keep in mind that it is not easy to shatter a myth. It is a process, an ongoing process. When researching how these six artists could redefine art in Montana, I looked at three things, place, education, and community. The Montana modernists carried with them an extensive artistic lineage, which they combined 
with observations of their present place in society. Isabel Johnson and Bill Stockton, ranchers and artists, portrayed their versions of place in a way that reframed the narrative of Montana at that time. Francis Senska and Jesse Wilbur, partners and lifelong friends, inspired each other as they discovered their voices. Their presence as teachers, enhanced by their own work, rose above the hum of traditional images and continued to inspire as students became artists and those artists became teachers. Robert and Jenny DeWeese showed by example what it meant to live life as an artist. Their home, nearly always filled with creative sorts, inspired decades of young people to pursue the truth of their work on their own terms. The influence of these artists can be seen in the art world today, handed down through generations. During the period in America, after World War II, soldiers became veterans and needed a way and needed to find a way to express the experience of war within the context of peace. Atomic power, including the capacity for assured mutual destruction and a nuclear winter, preyed on many months as schools taught children to hide under their desks in case of an attack. The country made it through the Great Depression with the taste of what a government safety net could provide. However, couched in Cold War terms of communism, those same ideas became dangerous during the McCarthyism of the 1950s. How would artists translate their fears and hopes into art? American art, in the form of the abstract expressionists, electrified the air and that change could be seen across canvases and on walls. A broad reaction to the basic elements of common experience, abstract expressionism spoke to these new conditions. Not only were artists in the United States asking, what did it mean to be human? They also asked, what did it mean to be American? This new arm of modernist painting symbolized an individual who realized a kind of freedom and a deep engagement of the self within the work. These Montana modernist perspectives, or way of seeing, stemmed in part from their personal point of view, encompassing what they saw in their daily lives, the land and their gardens, the things they interacted with each day, each season, with the minute variations and always changing light, availed itself to their artist's eye and informed a personal statement that came through in paint and color, surface and texture, composition and form. Developing and redefining their art by instilling modernism into an environment that had only been exposed to illustrative or mimetic artwork indicated they felt the readiness of Montanans to accept this new visual language. Through the familiarity of print images, ideas of modernism hovered in the minds of some around the state. People may have seen modern art in magazines, but at that point, they still did not see themselves expressed in it. This wave of post-war war artists needed to express themselves differently from the Western illustrative work that permeated the state. Their experiences, their point of view, and the changing world they found themselves in required something more. Isabel Johnson and Bill Stockton were friends and colleagues with a shared sense of place and the knowledge of hard-earned calluses from working with the land. 
rooted in the tangled gullies and stretching hills of central Montana, Stockton's work, imbued with fragility and stamina, speaks to the impending threats of winter and the anticipated orchestra of spring. Stockton's home, a sheep ranch in Grass Range, Montana, marked his physical place on the land, but his art denotes his own experience in reflecting the power of place. Johnson was born and raised on a ranch in Absorkey, Montana. Her family's homestead, which sat along the Stillwater River near the Beartooth Mountains, became the frame for her body of work. The geographical strength of her life matched the power of her paintings, centering on the landscape that shaped her. From the willowy outlines of Johnson's distant mountain silhouettes to Stockton's patterned impressions of his surroundings, art enabled them to visualize the power of place. Both traveled to Europe to learn at the knee of the modernists. Neither of them conceded to the commercial art world. Their voices spoke in terms of the formal aspects of painting, which reflected their training. Both experimented with their own strand of modernism that held fast to an intimate relationship with the land through abstract portrayals of nature to which they gave concrete expression. Isabel Johnson, born at the turn of the 20th century, grew up ranching and with, with her two sisters and her brother, which meant hard work hauling rocks, cutting and baling hay, caring for livestock, fixing fences and machinery. Her work ethic continued when Johnson graduated from the University of Montana in 1922 with a degree in history at a time when very few women earned bachelor's degrees. She taught history at Fromberg High School for two years before heading off to Columbia University in New York for a master's degree in history. While at Columbia, Johnson took an art history course that pivoted her from, art, from history to art. She then enrolled in the Otis Art Institute in Los Angeles and even began working toward a doctoral degree in political science at the University of Southern California. Obviously, she had a deep love of learning and before finding art, seemed to be drawn to disciplines explaining the past and how perhaps to influence the future. With art, she could discern her individual point of view about Montana and her beloved ranch in Stillwater, which seemed to draw her back time and time again. Once she finished her formal schooling, Johnson took a year off to travel to Europe and study the masters. During an interview at the age of 70, Johnson noted that she did not feel comfortable calling herself an artist. She said, I'll never forget that I'm trying to be one. For Johnson, the lines in nature felt like topography, guiding her in and around the foothills and creeks that expressed a wild and infinite dedication to her interior sense of self, meshing perfectly with her exterior surroundings. In her 1958 oil painting, red willows in winter landscape, a hint of gray works its way along the top of the piece, a thread of sky laid bare. Mountain tips obscured by snow-laden clouds frame the horizon. Deliberate hard-edged cliffs stagger across the piece, black and smothered by erosion. Along the foothills, a rolling tumble of brush shows the viewer the oxbowed creek bottom silvered in frost, buffered by snow. Although the title refers to red willows, 
Instead, their salmon pink and orange bodies bend in the inferred wind. Johnson's use of colors like the shadowed ochre banks express a season known for its colorless limits, yet convey a hidden abundance. Johnson found more inspiration from Cezanne than from Charlie Russell. As Bill Stockton once said, Paul Cezanne was her teacher and her influence. Cezanne didn't explain how to apply paint, how to design or how to draw, no. He taught her only how to look with the eyes of a poet at the very things she loved. She learned on her own how to transfer that love into the images we see now. Not enmeshed in the traditional cowboy romance of place, Johnson wished only to portray her own sense of what it meant to be Montanan. This is evident in Johnson's Trees Winter, depicting a tangle of cottonwoods vying for attention. Some trees bend in dancing grace, others stand with branches upward, echoing the trees Cezanne painted later in his career. Johnson gives her trees a heavy outline, as many of the post-impressionists did, to evoke feelings through form and line, space and structure. Her use of broken color feels like a quick sketched line made in a moment of tenderness. Bill Stockton's paintings also speak to an attachment to place. In his own experiences, blend to portray central Montana's hard edge and soft underbelly. In 1947, after serving in World War II just outside of Paris, he enrolled in the Minneapolis School of Art on the GI Bill, and the next year went back to Paris with his wife Elvia and his one-year-old son Gilles to attend the Académie de la Grande Chaumière, a school previously attended by modernist teacher and artist Hans Hoffman and the sculptor Alexander Calder. He studied the Cubists like Georges Braque and Pablo Picasso, but it wasn't until he returned to Montana that he found his milieu. In an artist statement, he said, it would be years later after art school that I would see the Jackson Pollock paintings for their worth. He was composing patterns instead of objects. Overlaying his work is a veil of a hard life scarred by living through the Great Depression, among other things. It's a time Stockton and others who lived through the Depression called the Dirty Thirties. For Stockton, it referred to the hard winters, the dry summers, and the death of his sister. These impactful and formative years laid down a foundation from which Stockton based a majority of his work and was the reason he never painted a clear blue sky. Stockton's distinct voice called out from grass range like the baleful, the baleful coyotes he tirelessly kept his sheep from. His paintings divulge the sudden blooms of winter snow, the boot-sucking mud of defrosting springs, and the dry, brittle grasses of blinding summers, where blue skies meant nothing but cracked soil in want of rain. It was Pollock's philosophy to portray the patterns of his daily life, the rocks, the field, the weather, and the ground itself that enabled Stockton's work to evolve and embrace the abstractness in nature, as in his painting, Snow Formation. Here, the angles of driving snow appear across the piece like a battleground with flying jagged swipes of color. A blue background spans the painting without a clue to the horizon line, foreground or background, like a ground blizzard Snow formation steals the certitude of safety 
of sure-footedness. Wild brush strokes slash black, gray, and white, while the blue underpainting speaks to the below cold drifts, oblivious of any life it may smother. Stockton's wallpaper series reveals his sense of interior place. They speak to the role of memory in creating the formidable markers of life that resonate within the artist through his work. One such piece from his wallpaper series, Faded Roses, consists of repeating patterns of ghosted flowers, disappearing petal by petal into the yellowed and uneven background. Although the pattern gives the viewer an impression that each repeated rose appears identical, the maker's hand clearly stands out. Like so many days gone by, differences gradually dissipate. Deviation, deviations from each rose denote not only a wistful regret, but the countdown of the calendar. Included in this piece, is Stockton's own bent figure with a downward glance as seen from behind. His white hair and aging face, delicately defined, echo the self-portraits of Rembrandt. He includes himself because this wallpaper reflects his own memory of growing up in small houses, in small towns, where the bare cobbled walls offered little distraction from the hard farm life in central Montana. For Stockton, the wallpaper represented a way to think about home and hearth. And it was an avenue to access the individual struggle for beauty under even the most dire of circumstances. There is a certain strength in the recollection of a place when that place cradles hard memories and deep-seated emotions. Johnson and Stockton did not paint replicas of majestic mountains. They painted what they saw exactly as they saw it, acknowledging the grandeur and the harsh conditions under which they toiled daily. They brought their formal training to a place unfamiliar with the modern art world and working on the vanguard of Montana's art scene expanded the vocabulary of the day. In so doing, they influenced generations of artists to come. Their shared perspective on where they lived and how they lived created a new definition of self. It was a language that invited the viewer to understand place in the same intimate way that they lived it. Bill Stockton and Isabel Johnson offered up a complex landscape helping us to understand their place and offering their version of what it meant to be Montanan. After World War II, veterans returned home and many took advantage of the GI Bill, attending college in groundbreaking numbers. Many colleges, including Montana State College in Bozeman, which is now Montana State University, started full-fledged art departments for the very first time. This development, this developed the need for young artists who became teachers. The Montana modernists all taught art and exposed their students to unfamiliar genres. Some taught at Montana State College, some at Eastern Montana College, and some like Bill Stockton taught art classes in the Lewistown Art Center. Their open-handed pedagogy filtered through the lives of an exponentially growing number of artists, not just influenced by the art of their teachers, but by the egalitarian nature of the teacher-student relationship. Students no longer treated as apprentices, but as artists in their own right, shared their work and showed their art at the same events, hanging side by side with their teachers. 
through the filter of place and of their own times, these artists passed on a unique aspect of their work. Among those who took the baton of the Montana modernists and passed it forward are those who also took on the role of teaching. The passing down of artistic legacy is as direct as the genetic inheritance to daughters and sons. Montana State College hired Jesse Wilbur in 1941 as part of a very small art department located in the basement of Herrick Hall. Five years later, Francis Senska joined the department. Their friendship and partnership remained a steadfast aspect of the Montana art community until their deaths. Let me move this. Hopefully you can see that. They shared their work both in teaching and in art. They shared a home they built together and each had their own studio overlooking the Gallatin Valley. It would be hard to talk about one without the other. but we'll try. Wilbur began her art career as a painter, but became well known for her printmaking. Senska began with ideas of becoming an industrial designer, but her ceramics grew to international fame. Each embodied the traits they taught their students. Try something and see if it works. As, as the Bauhaus artist and teacher, Laszlo Maholi Naj advised Senska and as Wilbur often said herself, experiment, experiment, experiment. Wilbur's 1950 woodblock print, Cats in a Garden, helps us to realize her unique sense of space. The circles of cats and garden each stand their own ground. In this print, she used a monochromatic theme, so the brown of the paper, earth and soil, became a changing background to the black ink as the viewer's eye moves from one delineated area to the next. The gouged wood creates rich texture in both the background of the cat and the leaves of the foliage. In a partial break from the circle theme, Wilbur acknowledged the horizon line but only in passing, not in illusionistic sense. Instead, she emphasized the flatness of the paper. Wilbur also used shallow depths to explore space and the division of spaces. With each circle, she draws our attention to the importance of individual things, expounding with intent each aspect of her personal world while interlacing the indoors with the outdoors, leaving only simple lines as thresholds. The River Don't Damn It, a woodblock print, incorporated the chine collet process of using, in this case, colored paper placed directly on the black ink of the woodblock and then applying the woodblocks to the paper, creating areas of color within the print. Wilbur's choice of colors, orange, green, and grays, overlap to enrich the image. The evaluation of all three steps in the process reveals Wilbur's precision, as well as her experimental philosophy of trying something and to see if it works. In addition, in this case, the end result retains the landscape of, and the nature of the piece. It also speaks to the continuous attention to current issues involving dams and rivers. This print commemorated a trip down the Missouri River she attended the Montana Institute of the Arts Festival in Haver in 1954. And today it stands as a reminder of the battles fought to preserve Montana's free, free flowing rivers. Whoops, wrong way. Ceramic artist Frances Senska's deep interest in local materials contributed to her role as a pioneering modernist. By drawing on her early years spent in Cameroon, 
the daughter of missionaries, Senska learned to value place and locality, which she applied in the creation of her gouged and painted pots. Senska's direct connection to Bauhaus artists, Marguerite Wildenhain and Laszlo Maholi Naj helped bring her studio practice into the modernist realm. Senska's father, a medical missionary station doctor, and her mother, a teacher at the mission station in the grasslands of Cameroon, <clears throat> contributed to her sense of community. Her father, also a craftsman, earned his way through medical school as a cabinet maker and a construction foreman. Senska learned how to use those tools standing by her father's side. Through her father's abilities to build and the lifestyle of Cameroon, Senska's aesthetic formed, specifically her lifelong dedication to functional objects. Methods of processing clay vary from potter to potter and remain integral for the integrity of the clay itself. Senska's methods came from her own tests and trials, which she demonstrated to students, making it part of her classroom work. Due to the purpose-built spaces, the culture of the ceramic studio, art is more communal than painting, ceramic art. Because of the cost of building such spaces, sharing it actually becomes a necessity. In addition to the convivial atmosphere of working together, Senska added field trips to collect clay and process it. Looking at Senska's 1979 branch bottle weed pot, the dark outer slips allows her figures of birds and abstracted foliage to stand out through her sgraffito technique. Cameroon pottery displays complex decorations, mixing a range of ornamental techniques and images. The 14 inch vase with its five spouts on top speaks to a flower or weed vessel animated by the birds and leaves on the body of the pot. Senska's appreciation of shape, color, and size overrides the utilitarian uses although those functions played a part in the overall design. Both this and the previous pot developed after Senska took a trip back to Africa as an adult in 1966. Senska's Yababo pots bring to mind Cameroon water pots, not only in approximate shape, but in their use of the sgraffito technique. The name Yaba Bo comes from African good luck, which is translated from the Cameroonian saying, it will be nine, which is a good luck chant in the Basa Bantu culture. Senska stylistically divides the space into nine segments, each depicting part of her natural environment. A turtle, two people in a canoe, birds, etc. These elements embody her African aesthetics, combined with a consciousness of the Bauhaus movement, yet also speak to the Montana experience. At the top, you can see that it says Yababo, and you can't really see all the different images on it, but just, just believe me that there are these other images. I wouldn't lie to you. Uh, nothing exists in isolation. Context places Senska's work in Montana, rooted in Africa, through the schools of the Bauhaus movement. Senska's work and life crossed the frontiers of ceramics. She learned from those who taught her how to live the life of an artist and the artist who taught her how to become a teacher. A potter's life may seem simple, but the strands that create an artist are not. Each piece Senska made holds tight to the experiences of her life. For Senska, even if she never made a dime from her art, her happiness derived from a life with her hands in clay. Up until the 1940s, the isolation of Montana contributed to the abutment place before modernism, keeping the status quo in place. But after 1949, 
the awareness of their isolation became a factor in creating an art community. Knowing their small numbers did not deter artists from seeking each other out, but had the opposite effect, it united them. Modernism in post-war Montana fought against the illustrative and romanticized Western paintings popular in the Rocky Mountain region. To keep to the tenets of Wilbur's experiment, experiment, experiment philosophy meant regarding, disregarding the male dominated society. Just as teaching offered these artists the monetary security of a steady art patron, an art colony climate offered by com a community of artists, dancers, musicians, and dramatists drew on each other's commitment to push back against the prevailing conservative meta-narrative of the West. Once ensconced at Montana State College, the Deweeses quickly found themselves with like-minded artists and creatives becoming central figures in the circle of artist gatherings. Every artist in the state would show up at the Deweeses. When Bob met Jenny while they were both in college, the relationship began as two artists fascinated with the creative process, struggling to find their individual voices. The notion of anything more than a friendship, albeit a deep connecting friendship, did not occur to them until separated by World War II their correspondences built up over time and revealed something long lasting. First and foremost, Bob and Jenny were artists and that seminal position became the basis for the rest of their lives. Robert DeWeese's work was prolific. Every day brought new opportunities to record his children, his wife, music, trees, and the road. Sketch after sketch shows a development of a vocabulary without words. His quick marks of impressions. Deweese's drawings depict honest portrayals, connecting the artist to the world, connecting being in time with being in place. With his sketches, he brought everyone into the conversation, translating the experience of being present into a language easily grasped by all. Some of Deweese's pieces employ the, the collage technique. I think that's the next slide. Yes, here we go. A collage technique made relevant by the Dadaists, such as Hannah Hawk and Max Ernst whose work spoke to the changed relationship between objects and humans. These issues still held relevance to the modernists in Montana. Dada is focused on creating artwork that questioned the societal roles, the role of the artist, and the purpose of art. Deweese also questioned the role of the artist in relation to current events and the politics of the day. By the time Deweese's VFW studio wall made in 1973, the total emergence of mass media ran rampant. The large mixed media on canvas work includes advertisements, newspaper headlines, Matisse-like cutouts, school photographs of his children, and pages seemingly torn from notebooks. The piece localized the Bozeman-based headlines and nationalized images with well-known figures, includes colors and lines for the sake of composition. It stands as a portrait of his studio and as an artist statement for his work. The openness of the piece conveys the presence of painted walls, suggesting, the limits, to the op suggesting limits to the openness, with grays and offset lines. He creates a sense of place, a place where anything goes. As in many of Deweese's works, he also brings with him the history of art. He is a painter and a teacher. His paintings tell the story of the past as they talk and point about the future. By bringing other art references into his work, his modernism presented a two-fold 
purpose to create art and to teach art. He once said there is no such thing as a realistic painting. Quote, the only way to get a realistic painting is to hang an empty frame on a wall. Deweese continued to note that even a photograph is not realistic, but only a mechanical way of recording the infinite value range in nature. After Deweese retired from teaching, he and Jenny opened G.B. Deweese Gallery in their Cottonwood Canyon home. For two years, they showed the works of nearly every artist they knew and some they eventually got to know. Gallery openings pulled in over 200 people and not just artists, but members of the community at large. The gallery crowded, crowded with intense conversation. Jenny noted the reason they opened the gallery is, quote, we decided we wanted to show artists who were good, who lived in Gallatin County, and who didn't teach art at the university because they couldn't exhibit there. In this way, they encouraged a larger community, not one confined to just the university, but expanded across those artificial boundaries. Here, their lens of modernism focused on offering a narrative to fit the community, not a community to fit an existing narrative. In 1949, when Jenny DeWeese first arrived in Montana, she brought with her the spontaneous yet complicated ideas of the abstract expressionists, Jackson Pollock, Willem de Kooning, and Franz Klein. But she also carried the lessons of the post-impressionists, Paul Cezanne and Henri Matisse. Including, included in the mix were the influence of abstract expressionists, Hans Hoffman, Nicholas de Steele, and known, Nicholas de Steele known for his thick impastoed landscapes, and the teachings of Hoyt Sherman, who also influenced Bob DeWeese, and who combined the idea of using the flat surface to convey, to convey dimensionality without resorting to shadows, lighting, or traditional perspective. In Hans Hoffman's theory of push and pull, which also influenced Bill Stockton, color and tension within the painting conveyed perspective, as opposed to the Renaissance discovery of the illusionistic diminishing horizon line. In her undated, untitled, non-objective non painting, Deweese speaks to her aesthetic philosophies inspired by Karl Off's 1936 epic choral composition, Carmina Burana. The spectacular opus by Orff becomes the perfect vehicle for Deweese's interpretation of Vasily Kandinsky's theory of visual music. The brush strokes, as well as the colors, create movement. The black underpainting pulls the eye around the canvas. Deweese reveals the character of the paint with a sweeping irregularity that enables the spaces to move back and forth in and out. This painting also conveys a sense of intimacy, like the whispering of a growing chorus. A hint of chaos creates a palpable tension. Up there. Beginning in the 1970s, Deweese's work on the Montana landscape deepened. In clear cut, Dewey sets the stage with the patterned stumps set against the dreary cloud-darkened horizon. The complete devastation depicted here speaks to her non-objective style in a way that substantiates the overtones of the piece. The distance instilled by the pattern feels almost cautionary, like protective armor. Deweese portrays a place invaded, violated, a place no longer imbued with purpose. Upon considering the land as, quote, mother nature, the expanse of defilement resonates with the voices of women, of betrayal and of loss. In 1989, Deweese curated the show Women's Work. The show traveled around Montana museums and community centers from 1989 to 1991. 
The purpose of the show was to create a collection of women artists from around the state to celebrate the Montana centennial. The show, while revealing how many women artists were working at the time, also exposed how little recognition they received. Of course, the idea that women often went unheard and unseen was nothing new to her. She'd spent her life creating her own voice while raising five children. The experience instilled in her motivation to get more women's work was to get more women's work seen by the public. Do we self-identified as an artist who stood up for women? By curating a show made of women artists, she brought these things to light. Through her paintings and through her role as a comrade in arms for Montana's artistic community, do we pull back the curtain on women in the arts? It also speaks to Deweese herself and her continual fight for women to be recognized. For Jenny Deweese, a woman's place was in the studio and in the gallery. She came to art at a time when women were scarcely heard. Museums and galleries routinely dismissed female artists. It became vital to break the glass frame, so to speak. Not only did she curate the traveling show Women's Work, but in 1995, she also served on a panel for the National Museum of Women's Art. What holds these artists together is not their style, although all of them trace their lineage to modernism, especially the work of Paul Cezanne, but rather it is their philosophy, their attention to the changing aesthetics buzzing throughout the country, their discussions, political and academic, would come across on the canvas and in the clay. The late nights, the conversations that lingered like so much smoke drifting across the room, bred a heady atmosphere. These artists shared a philosophical aesthetic clearly on the forefront of Montana's cultural language at that time. They believed in expressing the essential nature of place, winnowing objects down to the barest minimum needed to voice their perspectives. Through the exploration of place, artistic lineage, and community, the Montana modernists developed a deep-seated aesthetic that felt true to themselves and true to Montana. They set forth a new paradigm for Montanans to feel the density and full range of human expression, and through that, a way to view themselves without having to resort to historical tropes. The sense of place put forth by Isabel Johnson, Bill Stockton, Jesse Wilbur, Francis Senska, Robert DeWeese, and Jenny DeWeese included the articulation of modernism but also encompassed the landscape, which made their work accessible to those not familiar with the art world outside of Montana. They understood place as a source of sustenance and production of home and of hearth. They took the further step of expanding the parameters of Montanan identity and led by example. Embedded in the lexicon of the land, they translated and transform the understanding of Montana. After World War II, colleges served as a springboard for a new zeitgeist, a new kind of collective consciousness that spread from newly formed and invigorated art departments. In Montana, art professors found themselves teaching their peers as many of their students were of the same age and had served in the war as well. These veterans returning to civilian life began to question the notion of their American identity, which contrasted with a view of themselves before the war. In Montana, this questioning could not be answered with the art of the past, with the language of C.M. Russell. It needed to be rethought, reframed, redefined. Out of the six artists mentioned here, Four of them were women who used their role as teachers and artists 
to shine a light on what it meant to be a woman in Montana. Although they did not stand on soapboxes in the middle of town, they challenged gender roles in Montana through their art and through their lives. Senska used clay from the land itself to create her pots and glazes. See, she expressed an independence and identity directly through the modernistic imagery she put on her work. Translated into words, her work says, not everything is as it seems. A bottle may become a partridge and a wine set may be portrayed as a chicken. She also added the language of Africa to Montana art. The quote, primitive power of Scafrido, Scafrido, scratched into the dark blazes. Johnson told the world that she could do what she wanted, however she wanted, without regard for expectations. She stepped out of the role of the traditional rancher woman and became an independent artist who also ranched. Wilbur took the simple step of disregarding the lady hobbyist reputation of women artists in Montana and showed them the value of professional artists elevating the role of teacher to art professor. Jenny DeWeese, although a mother of five children and the wife of a professor, carved out her own space and by doing so strengthened her voice by brushing off the traditional view of the college professor's wives she instead showed Montanans the power women held when they worked together. Robert DeWeese, most strongly through his tie constructions and collages, made social and political comments on post-war America. He asked what it meant to be a man in, co in a commodity-driven society. He blasted print media and television's intrusion into people's lives through the form of advertising. Bill Stockton, also spoke to the mistrust of the mainstream art world through his life lived in grass range rather than close to the art markets of New, of New York or Denver, although he certainly could have taken part in them. Modernism in Montana became possible through the unequaled lifelong friendships and ties to a community they created, all of which culminated at the Dewey's home. As Rudy Audio pointed out in his memoir, It Comes Around Again, the DeWeeses were like, quote, a truth farm where everybody in Bozeman gathered. To come away with a critical understanding of the Montana modernists is to acknowledge the social rift between tradition and change in the form of artistic expression. The Old West was represented by a male dominated genre set forth with illustrative paintings and tall tale narratives conveyed through a mythological past, while the Montana modernists presented a newer way to see the West. The first Montana modernists fought hard to get their art in front of people other than each other. The task of redefining Montana fell on their shoulders as artists and as art teachers. By redefining the aesthetic art in Montana, they also redefined what it meant to be a Montanan. By changing the palette of art, they began the journey of addressing a new identity, of what it meant to live and work and create in a state beguiled by its own past. Identity is strongly tied to storytelling. Personal narratives, the bombastic style of advertising, media, and historical factors often morph into mythologies. The Montana modernists began to deconstruct the mythology they encountered all around them. It is only by providing a broader context for establishing a narrative that people can begin to understand their place within that story. The Montana modernists did that through their art by providing a canvas for all Montanans to see themselves portrayed there. And to that, they needed to redefine the nature of art in the state. Today, the tension between commercially viable art and artistically 
independent art still exists. The question of whether to furnish the market with redundant iconology or to create art that speaks to the experience of understanding place from white out January nights to summer glorious star drenched skies still haunts the studios and galleries in the state. What is the role of the artist in contemporary Montana? This was the question the Montana modernists asked themselves and their students. Their answer, to offer up alternatives to the status quo, to break the rules, to peel away the old narrative and lay a sturdy foundation for current artists and for artists to come. That's it. So I will unshare my screen, I guess. Is that right? Or should I keep it up? Um, you can keep it up, Michelle. Um, if people have questions, you might want to refer to it. So, um, so if anyone has any questions, you can either write them in the question and answer box or in the chat box. Um, that was wonderful, Michelle. Boy, I, what I would give to have a night at the DeWeese's house <laughs> in that smoke-filled room discussing politics and art and community and everything. Wouldn't that, to be a fly on the wall in that house would be just amazing. They all played instruments and they had, you know, it was just amazing. Music, oh, just that would have been amazing. Yeah, what a community that they formed. They really um, let's see, I'm looking for questions. Okay, anyone have any questions? Um, I have a question to start us off. Um, so when these, when they were, um, when all these artists that you spoke about were um, in their prime, were they selling their art or was? Um... There was no art market. There were no galleries. Uh, there were no museums. I mean, even the Yellowstone Art Museum, which started out as Yellowstone Art Center, didn't even come around until, you know, like the 1970s, I think. So they were, they had uh, the Montana Arts Institute, which was a group of artists, these guys, plus a bunch of other ones, um, and poets and playwrights and writers, and they would get together quarterly and they would have art shows and they would have, I, I'm imagining they had some readings as well. Yeah. And they would get together and, um, you know, they would travel across the state no matter the weather, I mean, just think of this, 1950s, bald tires on crappy cars. <laughs> oh, man. Nothing would stop them. They would go wherever it was to support each other. Wow. That's... We do that today and, you know, look at the kind of cars we have. Right, right. That's exactly true. Um, so we had, we have a couple of, um, um, Ann Orr says, fantastic program. Thank you, Dr. Coriel and Extreme History. Claire says, thank you for the interesting review, Claire Baker. Um, we did have a, um, a question, um, Michelle, um, via email er earlier this week that I shared with you about an, um, an exhibit that's up at the Montana Historical Society right now. Thanks to her, because she's also took my uh, Wanderlust class. Okay. Hey, I don't know if she's there. Um, but those artists are uh, not modernists, so they're not included here. And some of them are sort of more sort of traditional Western artists. And some were born here, but they moved to California or New Mexico. And, and so, um, yeah, definitely go see art wherever you can, for sure. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I have a preference for these guys, but I'm not trying to influence anybody. <laughs> So, so Janice saw the um, exhibit at the Montana Historical Society that's up right now. So um, it isn't modernist, but it's good art. So go see that as well. Um, but that, that brings me to the question, Michelle, um, is there anywhere to see some of the art that you talked about tonight um, currently up? Yes. So um, the, the place that has the most uh, of this art is the Yellowstone Art Museum in Billings. Okay. But the Museum has some, the Holter has some, um, Montana State University has some, um, yeah, I, I'm hoping, hoping, hoping my, my biggest dream is to get a book, a book, this book published of the Montana Modernists 
and to work with the Yellowstone Art Museum to create a small traveling show that could travel all around the state with these artists' work. Oh, that would be amazing. That would be amazing. So who's ever listening, please send good wishes out there for me. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, I'll do that. <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay, well, I, we don't we don't have any questions here coming up right now tonight. So um long presentation, I'm sorry. But no, no, it was great. Let, oh wait, wait, wait. Let's see. I I see some um okay. That this was great having studied under Jesse Francis and Bob de decades ago, Karen says. Karen from New Mexico. So thanks. Oh, how great. Oh, I wish to, Karen, send me an email. I want to talk to you. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah, and if you and I and we can put you in touch if you want to send us an email, we can send to Michelle as well. So um, so yeah, she says okay. <laughs> Oh, that would be wonderful. Good, good. Um, well, lives. I mean, and these people are scattered across the country, and it's amazing how much they actually influenced the art that's in the world today. Yeah, yeah. And Jane says, "Thanks. I really enjoyed hearing about these artists. Anxious to go see their works." Yeah. No, a road trip. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's for sure. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. And thanks to everyone out there for coming this evening. And oh, wait a minute. We do have another, we have a question that popped up. Um, did you meet, Michelle, did you meet any of these artists? I did meet Jenny DeWeese. I knew her before she passed away. And I would go up to her studio and hang out up there. And she was always giving me like a legal pad list of artists that I need to write about, like young artists. She's always like had it ready for me where, whenever I came through and she'd be handing me these lists. And wow. she was there, you know, uh, any art thing that was around, she was there. She, you couldn't keep her away. And oh. even when, I think she broke her hip or her leg later on in life, she was still painting. She'd lay on a mattress on the floor of her studio and be painting. Like you, up until the day she died, I think she was working. Wow. Well, that's so lucky you got to meet her. Yes, I do feel blessed. I wish yeah. I met her. I once met Frances, but she was quite, quite old when I met her. And I didn't, I didn't really, I was so intimidated. I really didn't say anything. Oh. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's hard too, but yeah, but at least you got to meet her. That's, that's wonderful. Well, good, well, good. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming tonight. And we have another um, presentation coming up for you on October 22nd. So October is a two for you get two presentations. <laughs> um, so we have Erin Bryn talking on October 22nd about um, uh, an examination of a crow war shield at the Chicago Field Museum. So hopefully you'll join in for that. Erin is a um, professor at a, a, at a college, at a tribal um, college at Salish Kootenai College. And uh, he uh, is a member of the Crow Nation. And he has um, given, I think he's given a presentation for us before, but this, so this will be a second one. But um, It'll be a really good presentation, so I hope people can join us then as well. So October 22nd, and we'll be sending out information about how to join on Zoom if you want to hear Erin's presentation then. So thanks again, Michelle, and thanks everyone out there in the virtual world for attending tonight, and uh, we hope to see you again a little later this this month. Thanks, okay. everybody. Crystal, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Michelle. That was wonderful. Thank you.